This next speaker has been here since the very first Skepticon, and he's come back ever since. I guess he likes it. <laughs> okay, here we go, Richard Carrier. Is philosophy stupid? That's what we're going to ask today. Um, I also have like pretty much most of this talk, but basically the notes and everything, uh, if you can't follow the slides or uh, I talk, I have, there's going to be loads of information. So uh, I have all of that online at that file location. So basically, if you go to that URL, uh, there's even a link to an, a non-animated version of the slideshow, uh, plus bibliographies. So there's lots of recommended readings and other things that are beyond what I'm going to talk about in this talk. So that file will be useful to lots of different people. So make a note of that. So. Let's begin. Why am I talking about this subject? Yes. Uh, some of you may know uh, this uh, sort of infamous thing that Lawrence Krauss, physicist Lawrence Krauss said, philosophy is the field that hasn't progressed in 2,000 years, whereas science has. Philosophical speculations about physics and the nature of science are not particularly useful and have had little or no impact upon progress in science. Um, this led to a, a series of debates with a, another philosopher in uh, the Atlantic. Uh, he kind of got schooled on this, but uh, some of the issues, th this, this actually represents a typical attitude that I find among scientists, uh, also people in the humanities. There are people in the humanities who, who have similar views of philosophy. Uh, here's another one, from Stephen Hawking also uh, got famously reported on. Most of us do not spend most of our time worrying about the big questions, but almost all of us worry about them some of the time. Traditionally, these are questions for philosophy, but philosophy is dead. Philosophy has not, taken, has not kept up with modern developments in science, particularly physics. Scientists have become the bearers of the torch of discovery in our quest for knowledge. Um, before I read the next quote. Uh, yeah, before I read the next quote, which is by Eric Dietrich, uh, who's a philosopher, says something similar. I should note that Krauss and Hawking said these things uh, in books they wrote that were essentially philosophy. Uh, neither of the books that, the, that these things were commented on uh, proved any scientific conclusion. They basically took a model of the way things could work based on the limited scientific knowledge we had and speculated a theory that could explain more things uh, that was not scientifically proved. It was just something they were putting forward as a possible explanation of things. Uh, that's called philosophy, uh, particularly it's metaphysics. Uh, so in, in books where they were saying philosophy is dead, they were doing philosophy. Uh, and then where they said philosophy doesn't make progress, they were claiming to make progress in philosophy. I find that kind of ironic, but it's a point I'll make again later. But here's a philosopher, like someone in the field itself, and this is one of the most outrageous quotes. Except for a patina of 21st century modernity in the form of logic and language, philosophy is exactly the same now as it ever was. It has made no progress whatsoever. We philosophers wrestle with the exact same problems that the pre-Socratics wrestled with, so we must concede philosophy's inability to solve any philosophical problem ever. So is philosophy stupid? Are these quotes correct? Uh, you'll hear a lot of these kinds of claims. I mean, you, these are the kinds of things I've heard. Uh, philosophy is useless. It's divorced from reality. Uh, it's too esoteric and obscure. Um, it's just pointless nitpicking over trivial minutia. That's actually a quote of me, by the way. <laughs> Gets nowhere, teaches and discovers nothing. And it's just opinion masquerading as knowledge. Uh, this is just a sample of the kinds of things you hear said about philosophy. Well, so how do we answer this question? I mean, first we have to start by saying, well, like, what are we talking about? What is philosophy? And one of the first things you have to distinguish is you have to take philosophy as practiced in the halls of academia versus philosophy, uh, what philosophy was invented for, what it was invented to be, and what it should and could be. So you have philosophy as a field of study, as a subject category of knowledge, and that's one thing. But how the current academic field of philosophy pursues that field is a different thing. And so if you're going to criticize philosophy, these, this is a distinction you have to make. And I'll give you an example later of, of where that distinction often is not made, but it should be. And it's important to note that when I say what philosophy was invented to be and should and could be, it actually sometimes is that. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit too. Uh, it's important to note what is the word. The word comes from ancient Greece. The Greeks invented this idea of philosophy. They invented it as a systematic field. 
uh, philo plus sophia, which means love of wisdom. Uh, and that's all it meant. It meant understanding yourself and the world, the way you pursue your worldview or your philosophy of life. That's what philosophy is. And it seems like that wouldn't be something that would be stupid. But also, uh, you get attitudes from philosophers who want to try and carve out philosophy as its own separate discipline that doesn't talk about wisdom, that isn't interested in understanding yourself in the world, where it's only concerned with conceptual logical analysis. So you, you'll hear statements like this, for this is from an actual philosopher, philosophy is only concerned with the analysis of concepts, not with facts. Um, that's easily demonstrated to be false. Uh, to give you the most obvious example, atheism. Uh, there's no scientific paper proving atheism in any peer-reviewed science journal. Uh, and yet that's a question of fact. And we can argue with pretty good evidence and, and, uh, and, and logical arguments that atheism is very, very probably true. Uh, it's a pro very probably true uh, historical fact, or uh, philosophical fact. It's not necessarily a science fact. You can use science to prove it. But it's nevertheless a conclusion in philosophy about the facts. And that's just one example. There are lots of other aspects. I'll give some examples as we go along, where philosophy actually is answering factual questions, uh, and respectably, and, and we should uh, be aware of that. So philosophy is not only concerned with the analysis of concepts. It's concerned with things, these questions fundamentally, and you'll see, you'll think that these things encompass science, but there's a reason why that's the case, and I'm going to get to that. But philosophy asks the questions like what exists and what doesn't, what its nature is or isn't, how much we can trust what we claim to know, how should we behave, how should we organize society, what we should infer from the facts of science to answer all of the above? And that's not a straightforward question. Science doesn't intrinsically answer that question for us. And how we should integrate those facts, scientific facts, with other facts, for example, from history, journalism, personal experience. So philosophy approaches things, asks questions like, who am I? Uh, that's a factual question, but that's a question that science is not going to really answer that for you. That's a question that philosophy answers. What should I do with my life? How can I be happy? Science can help you answering these questions, but it's not going to provide the answer. The answer comes from philosophy. Do I have the right friends? Are these bad friends? That's an example of a factual question. Philosophy is what you use to answer those questions. Am I a bad person? Should I be living my life differently? What's worth making sacrifices for? How much sacrifice? Am I in love? What is love? I mean, you can't even answer the question without answer, the first question without answering the second. And again, science can help you answer that question, but science does not alone give you the answer. And then, of course, you know, is there a god slash afterlife slash cosmic plan, uh, mystical crystal powers, whatever that may be. So philosophy helps you answer these questions when science isn't able to tackle them or isn't something that science is focusing on. And ultimately, philosophy can also mean, because of that, your philosophy would be your worldview, or someone else's philosophy is their worldview, their philosophy of life. Philosophy is the, the science or the art, the skill, the practice of discerning knowledge that would compiled together would be your worldview, the way you see everything. So the analysis of concepts is only a part of philosophy. It's a very important part of philosophy. It is a distinctive part of philosophy, but it's only a part. Philosophy is the quest for understanding. That's what it really is. And that's where conceptology fits inside that, but it's only a subset of it. Understanding of yourself and the world. It is what you use to construct and test your philosophy of life, your worldview. And as such, it very much concerns itself with questions of fact that science has not or cannot gain access to or conclusively resolve. So this is the sort of core reason why science or philosophy is not stupid. So are you doing it well or poorly, skillfully or incompetently, informedly or ignorantly? These are important questions because if, once you see what philosophy is actually for, what it's actually doing, what you're, what you're actually using it for, whether you recognize that you're doing that or not, you should acknowledge that you should be doing it with skill. You should be doing it with knowledge and information. You should be able to know how to do it well. Uh, and this is one of the things that we find with these scientists that are dismissing uh, philosophy. Uh, that's, that's bad for them to do because it means that they're dismissing even the prospect of learning how to do it well, and yet their worldview, their philosophy of life depends on their doing it well. And they remind me a little bit, these scientists like Hawking and Krauss, of the character Evil in the movie Time Bandits. Um, in, in that movie, he wanted to capture a map that gave him you know, all the time holes in the universe. It was kind of like a map to the cosmos. 
uh, and, and this map would make them all powerful. But that map you can see as kind of like science, like the quests of science, that the way Krauss and Hawking see science as the torchbearers of knowledge and so forth. So when he's talking about the map, I want you to think about like science, scientific truth. And this is what he says, this is a, a famous funny line. When I have the map, I will be free, and the world will be different because I have understanding of digital watches. And soon I shall have understanding of video cassette recorders and car telephones. And when I have understanding of them, I shall have understanding of computers. And when I have understanding of computers, I shall be the supreme being. Evil was a really terrible philosopher. No, there's a lot more to figuring out what you should be doing with your life uh, and becoming the master of yourself, not so much of the universe nevertheless, uh, than science and technology. That's not the sum of it all. You need philosophy and you need to be doing it correctly. Here's a more uh, correct criticism of philosophy, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about it, but I'll quote it first. This comes from Eliezer Yudkowsky. Philosophy is just not oriented to the outlook of someone who needs to resolve the issue, implement the corresponding solution, and then find out, possibly fatally, whether they got it right or wrong. Philosophy doesn't resolve things. It compiles positions and arguments. It would be one matter if I could just look up the standard answer and find that, lo and behold, it is correct. But philosophy, which hasn't come to conclusions and moved on from cognitive reductions that I regard as relatively simple, doesn't seem very likely to build complex, correct structures of conclusions. Now, this statement is actually correct as long as you make that distinction I was talking about before. When he says philosophy, when he's using that word throughout this, this paragraph, what he means is not philosophy the subject of study, which I was just outlining it before, but philosophy as now conducted by the academic community. And when you see the word philosophy in this paragraph as that alone, it's actually correct. And that is a valid criticism, because in fact, academic philosophy as a field fails to distinguish good and bad. It fails to distinguish good philosophy from bad philosophy. It fails to distinguish settled from unsettled in the domain of results. And it fails to synthesize well-tested results, even within the field of philosophy, and centralize them for easy consultation. Science does this really well, and philosophy could do it, it's just not. And uh, I'm not the first to say this. There's a, a renowned philosopher, Mario Bunga, um, in uh, 2001, I believe, wrote this book, Philosophy in Crisis, The Need for Reconstruction, uh, where he critiques philosophy, academic philosophy, and he says some of the things that Yudkowsky said, some of the things that I'm going to say, and some other pretty harsh things as well about philosophy as an academic field. But he recognized that philosophy as a subject of study doesn't have to be that. Uh, so, so he was distinguishing what philosophy could be with what it was, and he wanted to put it back on track. And I'm going to talk about his 10 points. He has 10 criteria of the way uh, academic philosophy today is failing. Um, and I'm going to bring those up later. But before I do that, I need to give you a little backstory. I need to explain uh, what we mean by the science versus philosophy divide, supposedly. It really goes all the way back to Aristotle. Now, really, there were, there were philosophers before him. Uh, for example, Socrates preceded him, and the pre-Socratics were the philosophers before Socrates. But all those philosophers were very unsystematic. Aristotle is the first to really create philosophy and organize it as a formalized, systematic field of study. Uh, so really, Aristotle has created what we now mean by philosophy. And what philosophy has done now is basically just an evolution of what he created. So it's important to look at that as sort of the beginning. And uh, part of what you can get from Aristotle is that there are at least six parts of philosophy. It can be divided in different ways. But even from his writings, you can see these particular fields of study. Uh, and these are the six different branches of philosophy, the same way you have biology and physics or different branches of science. And they're all interrelated. You can't do philosophy without doing all six pieces, because they all relate to each other. How you answer one affects how you answer the other. And the first, of course, is epistemology. That means your theory of knowledge. How do you know what you know? Uh, what are your methods? What are, your, what are the ways that you solve the problem of what's true and what's false? All of those questions is, are philosophical questions. They precede science. Science depends upon or the philosophy of, and epistemology in particular. Physics, uh, this is from physica, which is the Greek word that Aristotle used. At, in Greek, it meant what we mean now by science. It was all study of nature. So it included biology, it included geology, and so on. Now we sort of we use the word just for a particular branch of science. But when I say physics here, I mean all of science. I'm using the word the way Aristotle did. And that means all of the stuff that is knowledge of nature. What are, what are the facts that we know about nature? What, what can we know for, for certain? about the natural world and about human beings and so on. 
But after that uh, is metaphysics. Uh, now, metaphysics is a term that grew up later to describe Aristotle, the Aristotle's lecture that came after his lecture on physics. Uh, and metaphysics in Greek just means after the physics. Uh, but it really, it's evolved to become now what we do after science. Once science has done all the stuff it can do up to the point, let's say, time t, right now where we are, what, where do you go from there? All the stuff that you infer from what science has discovered, atheism, for example, is something that you infer. That's something you do after science. That's meta-science. Uh, and that's a branch of philosophy, and that's what we're talking about here. And this is what Krauss and Hawking were actually writing about in their books. They just didn't recognize that that's what they were doing. Aesthetics is an important field that often gets overlooked. That's theory of beauty. What's beautiful? What's ugly? What do you mean by that? Why is that the case? What is the significance of that? Uh, and there's lots of ways that aesthetics have important questions to them. Uh, I'm not going to go on about it here, but I do give talks about that idea of the importance of aesthetics as part of your worldview, thinking about these questions. But how you answer it depends on your metaphysics, and how you answer that depends on there's what you know about science, the science of beauty. That depends on your epistemology, how you answer questions in aesthetics. You can't do that if you haven't resolved your epistemology. So they're all interrelated. They're all interdependent. Ethics, of course, uh, moral theory, uh, what's right and wrong, why should we be moral, those kinds of questions are philosophical questions and fall into that branch. And politics, you might think politics is just politics, but no, politics is a subcategory of philosophy. When you think about politics and argue politics, you're doing philosophy. And that's the theory of law and government, what sorts of laws, what sorts of governments should we have, and so on. Now, it's important to look that this is the complete thing, that this is philosophy as Aristotle created it. This six parts interrelated system is one whole that you're investigating. And notice that physics, science in other words, all of science, is a part of philosophy. It, it is philosophy. Uh, it's not something separate from it. In reality, science is just philosophy with better data. Uh, and I'm going I'm to prove this point to you with some, with some examples coming up soon. Which means, the corollary of this, is that philosophy is just science with less data. And I think if philosophers took that seriously and took the mantle seriously and pursued philosophy with a more scientifically rigorous method, a more scientifically informed method, they'd be doing really good philosophy. Uh, and in fact, some of the, like what Krauss and, and uh, Hawking were doing, is an example of good informed philosophy in, in the field of metaphysics. They just didn't have the data to prove their theories. Uh, I wrote a chapter, uh, what I'm about to talk about you'll find the evidence in The Christian Delusion. This is an anthology of several authors edited by John Loftus. Uh, in The Christian Delusion, um, I have a chapter on ancient science and on the, the, the history of science where I have the bibliographies and evidence and source notes that you would need to confirm these statements of mine, which are that ancient science had mathematical laws, precise observation, and controlled experiments. Now this, is, this busts a common myth about the ancient scientific world, the kind of science that Aristotle was doing, but more importantly, the science that people who improved on Aristotle were doing in the ancient world. In actual fact, again, this is contrary to the common myth you're told, certainly the common myth that most scientists believe, the scientific revolution, which took place during the course of the 17th century, did not introduce any new methods for doing science. All of the methods that were used by those scientists were already invented and already in place and already being used uh, 2,000 years before them. Instead, uh, instead, what happened is we recognized during the scientific revolution, it constitutes the recognition that less reliable methods are less reliable methods. And that seems like that should be an obvious thing, but it wasn't. It took us thousands of years to figure this out. So what it did is it, it recognized less reliable methods as less reliable and then attenuated belief to reliability the liability of your conclusion. That's the one fundamental revolution that occurred and reorganized the way we explored nature and decided what beliefs to assign certainty to. But science remained philosophy. It didn't become a new thing. In fact, science has always been philosophy and still is. What we now call science was still called philosophy all the way up to the 20th century. In fact, it was called things like natural philosophy or physical or biological philosophy or experimental philosophy, but these were all just branches of philosophy, and this is how it was formally recognized by the practitioners of science themselves. The word scientist, by the way, didn't exist until the 1830s. This is something that people don't realize. It wasn't even popular until the 1890s, and this has a significant uh, meaning that I'm going to get to in a moment. 
this is it. Galileo, Newton, Lavoisier, even Maxwell and Darwin, these quintessential scientists who are supposed to be leaving philosophy and, and defining a new field separate from philosophy, uh, they were all natural philosophers. They were known as natural philosophers. They referred to themselves as natural philosophers, never or rarely as scientists. Obviously, Galileo and Newton were never called scientists because scientists didn't exist. The word didn't exist in, in their day. They were only known as experimental philosophers, physical philosophers, natural philosophers. Lavoisier as well. Maxwell and Darwin would occasionally have been called scientists, but that wasn't the usual way to designate them or the way they talked about themselves. More importantly, all of those big names that I just mentioned, those really famous history book scientists, they all published many of their scientific findings in philosophy journals. That's how you did your stuff. Uh, there were spe specialized science journals uh, like in geology and so on, but there were also journals that published in philosophy and a lot of these uh, findings that they do, their scientific discoveries, were published in philosophy journals. That was just what you did. There wasn't anything, there wasn't a demarcation in that regard. And in fact, the first science journal that ever existed in human history, published by the Royal Society of uh, Great Britain, retains the same title it has always held, retains today, the same title it has always held since the age of Newton when it was first published, The Philosophical Transactions. And of course, even now, scientists get doctorates in philosophy. That's what PhD means. Uh, to give you an example, uh, here this, there's a book I'm showing here uh, by P.M. Harmon on the natural philosophy of James Clerk Maxwell, uh, where he shows that Maxwell regarded all of his natural philosophy as the same one body of exploration. He didn't distinguish his science from his philosophy. He didn't call one science and one philosophy. It was all his philosophy. The only distinction he made is which points he could prove and which points were less, more speculative or less speculative. Uh, and that's the way Maxwell saw things. That's the way people in Maxwell's day saw things. Uh, and that's important. Uh, that means that we're not looking at a dichotomy between science and philosophy in the day of James Clerk Maxwell. And I have here uh, a school textbook uh, from the year 1860. This is the title page of it. Let me read you the title here, because uh, it is really small type. School Compendium of Natural and Experimental Philosophy, Embracing the Elementary Principles of Mechanics, Hydrostatics, Hydraulics, Pneumatics, Acoustics, Pyronomics, optics, electricity, galvanism, magnetism, electromagnetism, magnetoelectricity, and astronomy. Uh, also includes a diagram of a steam and locomotive engines and of the electromagnetic telegraph. So this is clearly a textbook in science and technology, and yet look what it's called, School Compendium of Natural and Experimental Philosophy, and this is in 1860. So you can see what I'm talking about here. Science has always been philosophy, really. Now let's talk about Darwin, uh, you know, encroach on PZ's field here. Darwin's theory of evolution was commonly referred to as a discovery in physical philosophy or philosophy of biology, and as it was often itself called the philosophy of evolution. And these are by, even by its proponents, not just uh, its supposed detractors. The idea of accusing it, calling it philosophy would not even be a derogatory concept at the time. So even in Darwin's day, the demarcation was not between science and philosophy, but between two different kinds of philosophy. And in fact, it was a spectrum of reliability, not really two categorically different versions of philosophy, but this spectrum of reliability based on the certainty of results, which in turn was based on access to data. And that was the only distinction made, and it was a spectrum, not a dichotomy. So the shift, this idea, this, this break, supposed break between science and philosophy, which occurred only in the 20th century, was never justified. Science today is just the best philosophy we have. Not because it's free of error or fraud, there's plenty of error and fraud in science, but because it works on questions we have the best data to answer. But that does not leave the rest of philosophy with no data, as if you have only enough data to prove something scientifically or you can't know anything about anything uh, other than that. That's not the case. What it means is that if you don't have enough data to prove something scientifically, that just means you have data insufficient to meet scientific standards of certainty. But not all standards of certainty are that high level. But there are many degrees of certainty below the scientific, in history, in journalism, in your own personal life, for example, and in philosophy. So, for example, bringing that example in again of atheism, 
It's a highly certain factual conclusion, but not a scientific conclusion. There's no scientific paper proving it, at least not yet. Now, here's another scandalous thing to suggest, and I did hint at it earlier. Scientific hypothesis formation is philosophy. It's doing metaphysics, ultimately. Uh, and this is, I mentioned that Krauss and Hawking were doing, it's, and Darwin would recognize this, Maxwell would recognize this, this idea that if you're forming hypotheses, coming up with things and ideas, and even doing it informally, informed by the sciences, you're doing philosophy. And then when you get enough evidence to prove it, you've still done philosophy, you've just done it, you've just done it with better data. And an example of this is superstring theory, one of the most important uh, developments in uh, the concepts of science. It's a theory that has nowhere near being proven yet, uh, so it isn't officially science. It's not a conclusion of science. It's a theory that's very well informed. It's very good philosophy. It's being developed by scientists who know what they're talking about, but ultimately it's philosophy. Superstring theories is metaphysics, Aristotle, Darwin, Maxwell, they would all recognize it as such. So let's get to Mario Bunga's 10 criticisms that I mentioned before, that philosopher who wrote that book, uh, Philosophy and Crisis. Uh, his criticisms are these. Uh, one of them is he thinks tenure chasing is supplanting substantive contributions. He thinks a lot of philosophy papers are just boilerplate to just get published, and they aren't really tackling real, real problems that are, that are important. So he thinks it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of philosophers who are just grinding away, not really taking philosophy seriously as a quest for knowledge that will benefit humankind. Um, yeah, there's, there's some of that, that's true. Not all philosophy can be accused of that, but there is a lot of that, and it's not being policed. Uh, he says there's a confusion between philosophizing and chronicling, and this is something, a criticism I've leveled many times, is that philosophy just can't figure out how to tell the difference between history of philosophy and actual philosophy. Uh, and you can imagine, like, if, if science journals didn't make any distinction between science and history of science, and just published them side by side, uh, and it, it would be weird. You, you want science journals to cover science, history of science journals to cover history of science. That should happen in philosophy. Academic philosophy is just not doing it. Uh, insular obscurity slash inaccessibility. Uh, this is something where philosophers are creating methods of, of jargonizing, methods of structuring their, and, and writing down their arguments and publishing them that are completely obscure and inaccessible to non-philosophers. Uh, and they're doing nothing to rectify this. Now, to an extent, you could say the same thing of science papers, but even science papers, anybody can grab one and kind of figure out what it's talking about. In philosophy, that's often not the case. And even the ones that are difficult to figure out, even the scientific papers that are difficult to figure out altogether, science does a really good job of popularizing that and making the information available in versions that can be understood by non-scientists. Philosophers are not doing this hardly at all. Obsession with language versus solving real-world problems. Um, by this, he means not that there's anything wrong with the philosophy of language and logic. That's a very important aspect of philosophy. And in fact, you, I'm going to point out some of the most important advances in philosophy are in that field. But his concern was that philosophers were way too obsessed with it. And remember that quote I had earlier where they said philosophy only does concepts and doesn't do facts. Uh, that's the obsession with the concept part of philosophy and abrogating the responsibility to tackle the real world problems, those factual questions that philosophy should be solving. So this is more of a question of proportion of attention. And he's right about that. Uh, he complains about idealism versus realism and reductionism. Uh, you can Google those terms if you want to know more about them. But basically his point is it's pretty much a settled question that some form of scientific realism is true and that all knowledge, all objects and things that exist can be reduced to more fundamental things and that should be the project of the human quest for knowledge. Science has been, he has admitted this, you know, 100, 200 years ago and has been working on the project and making a lot of progress on it. Philosophers need to agree that, that scientists are on the right track with that and then all of their work and their inferences, their meta-science, the, the inferences they draw from science should be going in the same direction and trying to drive knowledge further in that direction. There shouldn't be any focus on these other ideas of philosophy that uh, have been discredited long ago. Too many mini-problems and fashionable academic games. Uh, that's similar to his first point, except what these things are, things that are important, uh, but they're, they are, they're so trivial uh, that there wouldn't be anything wrong with them if they existed and were being published. It's just that there's too much attention to them. There should be more attention to things that matter, that matter more. Uh, this is another one that's very important and one that I've uh, commented on as well, is poor enforcement of validity slash methodology. Peer review in philosophy sucks, um, sorry to say. Uh, they have very unclear standards, very inconsistently applied standards. 
Uh, in science, we, that you, if you've been reading the news in science, you know there's, there's been some scandals recently and some serious discussion about problems with the peer review system in science. So even the peer review system in science has troubles. Philosophy won't even admit that it has a problem, so it's not even going to begin trying to fix it. And Bunga points this out, gives some examples. Uh, I've seen it myself. Uh, and it's unsystematic versus system building and worldview, achieving worldview coherence. Remember when I showed that, that diagram of Aristotle with all the branches of philosophy and how they're interrelated and you can't do one without doing the others? Well, what, what, guess what academic philosophers are doing? They're doing their little niche philosophy without doing any of the other stuff. So they're making, they're walking right in with a bunch of unproven assumptions about epistemology and metaphysics and all these other things and then trying to draw a conclusion and saying they've made progress. They're not uh, spending enough attention to building a complete coherent worldview and then making sure that, that every paper that they publish is consistent with that. And detachment from intellectual engines of modern civilization. Bunga means uh, science, technology, and ideologies that actually drive mass political action in the world. Philosophers are not really engaging with these things. They're not really examining these things. They're not really well informed on these things. Now, this is not true of all philosophers. There are many philosophers who do this well, but there are also many philosophers who do it badly. And philosophy as an academic field is not making the distinction between them. And ivory tower syndrome, which is related to this, uh, where it becomes insular in the sense that philosophers aren't walking out to other departments, ac other academic departments, and saying, hey, what kind of questions are you guys wrestling with? Could we give you a hand? Like, wh what ways could we help you? And could you catch us up to speed and inform us so that we can be more informed in the way of framing philosophical questions that arise from your work? Philosophers are not collaborating with other departments as much as they should. They're not doing that kind of thing. They're just talking to each other, essentially. This is a problem with academic philosophy. It's not a problem with philosophy as a subject of study. It doesn't have to be that way. So how do you find the philosophy that avoids all 10 of Bunga's defects? It's not very easy to do. Philosophy as an academic field simply isn't making any effort to do that. It needs, however, to be rigorously, philosophy itself as a subject of study needs to be rigorously demarcated from pseudo-philosophy and also erroneous and bad philosophy. Just as science is from pseudoscience and good science from bad science. Not all philosophy is pseudo-philosophy, uh, despite what Krauss and Hawking say, but there is no easy way to tell. Uh, it's published in the same journals and academic presses, it's presented at the same conferences, it gains the same, same professorships. Uh, so it's, it's exactly like we had science and pseudoscience, you know, astronomy and astrologers are working in the same department and no one was making a distinction between them. Now what is pseudo-philosophy? Pseudo-philosophy is philosophy that relies on fallacious arguments to a conclusion and or relies on factually false or undemonstrated premises and isn't corrected when noted. That's, that last part is important because you can have erroneous science just as you can have erroneous philosophy. Uh, just merely being an error doesn't make it pseudoscience or pseudo-philosophy. It's correctable. But if you're not correcting it, uh, you're, talk, I mean, you're still doing it, that's pseudo-philosophy. All supernaturalist religion is pseudo-philosophy. Uh, that's a popular sentiment here. It's scandalous elsewhere. I'm about to quote someone, uh, a, a famous philosopher of religion, Keith Parsons, uh, who basically had the emperor with no clothes moment and said, this is bullshit, uh, and he left his field. Uh, he actually changed his field of study because he said, this is, this is pseudo-philosophy. This isn't real. Uh, and, just, and nevertheless, it's treated as a respectable philosophy. It's published in philosophy journals as if uh, there's no difference. Uh, but let me read you this, his quote because it's quite brilliant. Because he, he wrote an article saying, uh, called Goodbye to All That, explaining to his fellow academics and to the world why he was leaving and, and why he thought it was as scandalous that f the philosophy of religion, in, in a serious sense, was still going on and being taken seriously. Now, before I read that, let me just point out that what I'm saying here is that religious philosophy is to philosophy as a subject of study what creation science is to science. The fact that creation scientists insist what they're doing is science doesn't make it so. And the same is the case with pseudo-philosophy. So when all those Christian apologists insist and complain that I'm you know, unfairly targeting them, uh, they're acting just like creationists, which, you know, big surprise. That's what they do. So here's what Keith Parsons wrote, and this is just a, a, a clip. There, you can read the whole part. The whole thing is pretty scathing. Uh, goodbye to all that at the Secular Outpost online. But these are, this is the salient point. I found the philosophical arguments in aid of religion so execrably awful and pointless that they bored and disgusted me. This is, a, this is a renowned professor of philosophy, by the way, saying this. 
I now regard the case for theism, quote unquote, as a fraud, and I can no longer take it seriously enough to present it to a class as a respectable philosophical position, no more than I could present intelligent design as a legitimate biological theory. I do not mean to charge that the people making that case are frauds who aim to fool us with claims they know to be empty. No, theistic philosophers and apologists are almost painfully earnest and honest. I just cannot take their arguments seriously anymore. And if you cannot take something seriously, you should not try to devote serious academic attention to it. I've turned the philosophy of religion courses over to a colleague. <laughs> now, sadly, the same is often true of secular philosophy. And that's kind of the point that I've been making. Once you demarcate philosophy from pseudo-philosophy, once you do that, once you, and you go through and wheat, separate the wheat from the chaff, progress in philosophy becomes apparent. Like science, however, let me point out, va the vast majority of progress in philosophy consists of tiny incremental advances that look small or pointless, uh, but together amount to a significant body of knowledge. And if you don't believe me, just skim through any science journal and you go, what on earth is all this? Uh, a lot of it is small, tiny problems being solved that seem trivial. Uh, but that's most of what science gets done. But when you add all that stuff up, it's, it becomes significant. Philosophy, you're going to see the same thing. So you shouldn't criticize philosophy for saying, oh, that's a trivial, pointless thing, uh, because you could make the same criticism against science, and it would be just as incorrect a criticism. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, one of my favorite science papers is by Julian Vincent, The Quantification of Crispness, in which he invented a standard measure of potato chip crunchiness. Um, yeah, that's applied science. It's, it's a real scientific thing. So you, they have instruments now that you can measure the crispiness of a potato chip. Uh, here's another one is Joseph Ford. How random is a coin toss? Literally, they took a quarter and tossed it a bunch of times and answered the question. The answer is not as random as we thought. Oh, for those who really want the spoiler, uh, it has a slight, like a 10% higher chance of landing on the side that, you, that, you started, that it started on. So for those who want to rig a, a coin toss, that's, that's the key. Although it only gives you a small lead. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this one's kind of famous and well-respected. A huge, vast study, well-funded, uh, many years in the making. The study of the therapeutic effects of intercessory prayer in cardiac bypass patients, a multi-center randomized trial of uncertainty and certainty of receiving intercessory prayer. Uh, this, of course, decisively proved that prayer doesn't work. And you might think, why are we wasting all this time and money proving the obvious? Um, but that's what science does. That's a valid thing that, that science can do. And it's a, it's a valuable study. It's worth citing. It is sad that we have to spend all this time and money disproving delusions. Uh, but you know, if the delusions exist, that's what we have to do. So when you look in a philosophy journal and you see something similar, you say, well, that's just proving the obvious. Remember this intercessory prayer paper. This, that science was proving the obvious. But it wasn't as obvious as you think. Uh, so it's still valuable, important science. When you find the same thing in philosophy, it's also still valuable and important philosophy. Uh, and there's a philosopher who wrote in Philosophy Now Online, Is Philosophy Progressive, about whether it makes progress. He pointed out a few uh, ways that it does so. Two of them I'm going to talk about is progress as destruction. And this is probably one of the more obvious forms, is that philosophy eliminates options from logical space. It demonstrates incoherence internally or with established science and rules those things out. The result is that the options in philosophy are enormously more constrained now than they were 100 or even 50 years ago. And no philosophy, as a result, we have no philosophy of magic, numerology, mysticism, astral planes, angels, demons, gods, souls, or miracles, all except as counterfactual thought experiments, of course. And things like Platonism and idealism, etc., only exist now as pseudo-philosophy. There, there is no respectable, uh, or no honest philosophy that does that. Now remember what Dietrich said about the pre-Socratics. Uh, that's what we're talking about here. He said we're still arguing the same things the pre-Socratics were, and that's simply not the case. Uh, we've eliminated a lot of the, their arguments. We've eliminated a lot of other arguments in the interim. And we're actually arguing things now that are much more advanced and sophisticated than even the pre-Socratics could conceive. His second point was progress as clarification. I think it goes beyond that. But what he means is distinctions, possibilities, meaning, and implications. We've learned a lot, tons and tons of things. Like a lot of scientific, pro a lot of philosophical progress consists of learning about these things, knowledge in these domains, distinctions, possibilities, meaning, and implications of them. 
Uh, also exposing assumptions. This is one of the hugest things that philosophy does. A lot of times where our thinking is based on assumptions we make that we're not aware of, philosophy exposes those. That consists of knowledge. That's progress in knowledge. And philosophy does these things in ways that have, actually have real world impacts, impact. Um, one of the biggest ways you see it impact is through legal decisions in the way legal decisions affect the law and the way, the way that our governments treat us and so on. So this is a huge way that it affects our lives. Uh, it's not just direct, but it, it's used the same way that science is. When you look at, for example, read the Roe v. Wade and Kitzmiller v. Dover decisions. Roe v. Wade, you know, of course, what that's about. Kitzmiller v. Dover, of course, was the decision that got creationism finally kicked out, or I should say intelligent design finally ruled as not science and kicked out of science class. There, when you look in there, you'll see the influence of philosophy as much as the influence of science in the, the judge's decision making and in uh, the way uh, testimony was taken, the things people said uh, in testimony during, during the trial. Philosophy made a difference, and it's these kind, this progress and clarification was part of that. Less obvious examples, and this is something I've already mentioned, was scientific speculation and theorizing. I mentioned superstring theory, but quantum theory. We haven't explained qu why quantum mechanics is the way it is yet. Uh, that's metaphysics. Uh, so when you see quantum theory, that's metaphysics. Cosmological theory. We don't really know which version of the Big Bang theory is true or what caused the Big Bang, uh, but we have lots of theories, and, and these models and theories are versions of me metaphysics. These are philosophical things. So superstring theory, quantum loop gravity theory, and so on. But also mathematical theorems and discoveries. Now remember when that philosopher I quoted said that philosophy is just the analysis of concepts, not facts? Well, what is mathematics? It's just the analysis of concepts and not facts, except that the concepts that get analyzed have a huge impact on the way we understand facts. And I'll give some examples of that. But when you look at advances in mathematics, you're looking at advances in philosophy. It, just because it's called mathematics doesn't make a difference to that. This is advances in knowledge, discoveries in knowledge, in logic space. Jump the gun there. Oh, no, it didn't. Sorry. And we get to, and facts most probable. I would just want to add that. Remember, that's also what philosophy does. Uh, Vogel Carey doesn't mention this particular aspect of progress, but it does. Atheism is an example of progress in philosophy. It's not all that different from science. Uh, most scientific progress consists of destruction as well, also eliminating or narrowing hypotheses. Much of it consists of clarifying the available options given the known facts, and the rest consists of building an edifice of highly certain conclusions to use in understanding and improving the world, which is what the rest of philosophy does as well. They just focus on different things and with different bodies of evidence. Some major general advances made by modern philosophy that I want to point out here. And I'm just going to quickly go through them. If you don't know what they are, oh, well, these you'll know what they are, but if you don't know what they are, and this and the several coming slides, Google them, find out about them. Some of the major advances made by modern philosophy is that naturalism has basic, is now basically standard philosophy. Supernaturalism is pseudo-philosophy. That's, that's an advance, that's a progress we've made in philosophy. Evidentialism, uh, that has now, in the field of epistemology, that has now supplanted mysticism, authoritarianism, dogmatism, the idea of a priori facts, and faith-based epistemologies. They've all been overthrown. They only exist in pseudo-philosophy now. And we often take that for granted, but that's actually a significant advance in philosophy. Consequentialism in the ethics, that's another thing you take for granted. You assume it's so taken for granted now that even now when Christians argue against homosexuality or whatever it is, they, even they think that they have to come up with reasons, consequences, why it's bad. But that didn't used to be the case. We take that for granted. That's an advance, that's a philosophical advance so powerful that even Christians can't get rid of it. Uh, in, it used to be just authoritarianism, absolutism. God says it was wrong, that's it, I don't need reasons. Uh, the idea of democracy and human rights, but the idea of a democracy that's limited by hu human rights. These concepts originated in the ancient world and ancient philosophy, but they gained significantly in sophistication over the years and ultimately are the foundation of modern Western society. These are advances, these are philosophical advances in the area of political philosophy. And that's against ver versus fascism, aristocracy, autocracy, even Athenian democracy, which was not the great form of democracy. Uh, we have much better forms of it now, and those are philosophical advances. And aesthetic relativism. We take for granted in aesthetics uh, that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? Versus cosmic aesthetics. Things are beautiful only because God decided it, and if you disagree, then you're wrong. Uh, or aesthetics as morality, the idea that if it's disgusting or gross, therefore it's immoral. Uh, these things have been overthrown by philosophy. They only exist in pseudo-philosophy now. 
So that's a lot of progress that philosophy has made in, in broad general respects. Some major specific advances made by modern philosophy, uh, late 19th century, let's look at these, set theory, symbolic logic, reduction of mathematics to axioms in logic by Bertrand Russell, transfinite mathematics by Gregor Cantor. Cantor. In the 20th century, here's some big ones, game theory. Game theory is one of the most important advances in, in the history of philosophy. But no one calls it philosophy because it was done in the mathematics department. But it's philosophy, and it's had r wide repercussions in uh, factual and empirical fields. Uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorems you may have heard of, uh, but I would also advise you to look up Dan Willard's work, which is, he has made in the last few years some of the most important advances in deductive logic, where he's actually shown he's partially overthrown Gödel's incompleteness theorems in important way and in important ways for establishing uh, uh, deduction against the attack made by Gödel. Uh, and so even just in the last few years, we've had significant, huge advances in deductive logic. Modal logic is another thing that we've advanced, has become much more sophisticated over the 20th century, and Bayesian epistemology, which has also arisen in the 20th century. So these, these are some serious and significant advances being made in philosophy. Small but important discoveries, uh, connecting the meaning of a statement with its truth conditions, and corresponding advances in defining truth, distinction between sentences and propositions, and its significance for cognitive science and AI research. The demarcation of qualia as fundamental as the fundamental attribute of consciousness. This is an advance in philosophy. Compatibilism, proving that desirable versions of responsibility, self-determination, and personal freedom are compatible with total causal determinism. This has been very systematically done over the course of the 20th century. Uh, this is a significant advance in philosophy. And more rigorous defenses of atheism and so on. So philosophy definitely makes progress. It makes a lot of progress. Uh, one of the most important examples is Judea Pearl's uh, uh, book, Causality, Models, Reasoning, and Inference. Uh, I'm going to quickly read this quote. This describes the book. And this is, a work of, this is the work compiling and systematizing philosophy and showing how scientists can make use of it. It's a comprehensive exposition of modern analysis of causation. It shows how much... Uh, it shows how causality has grown from a nebulous concept into a mathematical theory with significant applications in the fields of statistics, artificial intelligence, philosophy, cognitive science, and the health and social sciences, including business, epidemiology, and economics. Pearl presents a unified account of the probabilistic, manipulative, counterfactual, and structural approaches to causation, and devises simple mathematical tools for analyzing the relationships between causal connections, statistical associations, actions, and observations. This book will be of interest to professionals and students in a wide variety of fields. Anyone who wishes to elucidate meaningful relationships from data, predict effects of actions and policies, assess explanations of reported events, or form theories of causal understanding and causal speech will find this book stimulating and invaluable. So this is one of the most important advances in that particular study, in the study of causality and philosophy, and it's had wide repercussions in science. Now, I remember Krauss saying philosophy of science contributed nothing to science. I'm pretty sure Judea Pearl's work influenced discovery of the Higgs boson because they were using some of the theories of causality that he developed, and that not just he developed, but all the philosophers before him that he was relying on. And again, remember Hawking saying philosophy is dead and makes no progress. Well, uh, this, this book alone refutes that. Now, why is it much less progress? Obviously, philosophy makes much less progress than science. Vastly fewer personnel, that's kind of an obvious reason. Vastly fewer resources, that kind of explains a lot of it. But again, also the lack of focus, the bunga criteria. Philosophers are not getting together and organizing and putting themselves forward to defend good, solid, non-pseudo philosophy. So a lot of philosophical work is wasted. OK, so that's, that's academic philosophy, and that's the f field of philosophy. And so that, that, that's, that's enough to talk about there. But I'm going to end just briefly talking about the skills and why philosophy is important for you, for everybody, who, even if you're not a philosopher. So what skills are important to philosophy, or particular to philosophy? Logics. This is a particular skill that you learn in philosophy, and philosophy has got, that's the main field you want to go into. Uh, that or mathematics departments, but mathematics departments are philosophy departments, really, uh, are the way to do this. And that means building accurate logical mo models and fallacy detection, a very valuable skill. Even scientists need better at it than, than uh, a lot of them are. Conceptology, the study of ideas and the meaning and implications of words and concepts. This is a particular skill. It's not just something you do. It's something that requires a lot of knowledge and, and practice and understanding of the ways of doing it. It is an art and a craft. It is a science unto itself. Conciliation, completing inferences, completing inferences from the results of science and other fields, determining what's most probable given what science has already figured out. 
and filling the gaps in science. So you have God of the gaps argument is just filling, it, filling a gap with God. Philosophy fills the gaps by actually building sound arguments from evidence what most probably fills the gaps. So that's how you fill the gaps, you use philosophy. And that's one of the particular skills that philosophy, philosophy teaches its people and uh, is a particular field or a particular field specific skill that's developed there. And axiology, and that's completing inferences from moral, aesthetic, and political values. And so those are the four main skill sets that you learn in philosophy and that are particularly, those are the, the things that, uh, pieces of knowledge that philosophy will teach you and help you build more knowledge from them. So what does this mean for everybody else? We don't need to be scientists or to do science to broadly understand the results of science and apply it in our daily lives and personal philosophy, right? So you, you don't have to be a scientist, but you can know a lot, about a, a lot about science and that can affect the way you understand the world. In exactly the same way, we don't need to be philosophers or do philosophy at an expert or professional level to broadly understand the results of philosophy and apply it in our daily lives and personal philosophy, just the same way that we use science. We just have to figure out how to tell good philosophy from bad. The academy should be helping everyone do that. It's not, and that is a valid criticism of it. So I'll leave you with this. Remember the link uh, with all that information in there. But these two books are the ones I recommend you start with if you want to actually start thinking like a philosopher or start in being an informed layman in the field of philosophy. The first is the best textbook there is on being a philosopher. Most philosophy textbooks are really history of philosophy. Remember Bunga's criteria argument on that. Um, but, but there are very few that actually teach you how to think like a philosopher, teach you how to understand philosophical concepts and stuff. This is it. This is the best one. The Philosopher's Toolkit, a compendium of philosophical concepts and methods. So I highly recommend that. Next to that, of course, would be on my own book, Sense and Goodness Without God, A Defense of Metaphysical Naturalism. Now, why that book? Because this is that Bunga criteria about systematization, uh, philosophers aren't doing it. This is really the only book, and I, I'm astonished to say this, but it is true. It's the only book that actually presents a systematic, complete, coherent worldview, evidence-based, based on where we are in, the, in philosophy and science now, uh, published in 2005. But it gives you, even if you don't think everything, even if not everything in it is correct, and I'm sure it has mistakes in it, and I'm hoping to fix them if there are, even if you disagree with it, what it shows you is a model of how philosophy could be done and should be done in the academic field, and it shows you a model that you can take for yourself and try to tweak and fix or just and you make use of that uh, covers all those Aristotelian fields, epistemology, metaphysics, politics, ethics, and so on, aesthetics as well, and shows how they're all interconnected and how science informs us in all of them and how we can develop a non-pseudo philosophy from that. So please help support my work buy that. I think they are selling several copies uh, over there of Sense and Goodness Without God, amongst other things. Uh, and that's all I have to tell you about philosophy today.